This is um, June 8th, 2022. I'm Diane Barrett with the BE Collection, and I'm here with Emily. How do you say your last name? Dasco. Dasco, just like it's, it should be, right? Yeah. And uh, Emily's consented. Uh, you are, you have consented, right, Emily? Yes, absolutely. I've decided, because the consents get lost sometimes, just to do a verbal as well as the... Uh -huh. So um, tell me about yourself. Where were you born? I was born in New York City. Uh huh. And how long did you stay there? We lived in New York until I was four and then moved to California. Uh, my dad um, got transferred, I think, at his request because he was sick of putting up storm windows, he said. And um, we lived in Hollywood until I was 16 and then moved to Claremont, which is about 40 miles east of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I'm in Los Angeles. Yeah, tried, tried to communicate that. Yeah. And so what did he do besides put up storm windows? Uh, he's a lawyer. He worked for a big um, company called Thatcher Glass. Yeah. Do you have siblings? I do. I have the two greatest brothers uh, ever uh -huh. to walk the face of the earth, one older and one younger. Mm -hmm. Are they attorneys like yourself? No, my, uh, my older brother... Uh, works for a um, market research firm, and my younger brother is a radio announcer for a minor league baseball team. Huh. that's good. I went to the Dodger game just to hear Bre Jack Brickhouse, who was the announcer from Chicago. For the uh, my family's very, very big on baseball. We, yeah. Does that mean you also? Oh yeah. Good. So who's your who do you root for? Uh, Giants. I have season tickets to the Giants. You do good. Yep. That's fun. Yep. Good for you. And then, how did you um, come out? How old were you? When were you aware that? Um, I was in law school, so I was twenty-four, mm -hmm. um, twenty-five. Yeah, twenty-four, nineteen eighty-six. Um, uh, was when I really came out. I had my first relationship with a. Um, with the woman when I was living in Santa Cruz when I, uh, between college and law school. Where'd you go to college? I started at Vassar. I went two years to Vassar and then I transferred to UC Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And did you think, well, this is where I want to be. I'm comfortable with this or. I think um, when I first came out, I had an idea that uh all lesbians were supposed to be bu as butch as possible. And mm -hmm. so um, I kind of tried that image for a little while and then found that wasn't actually me and um, shifted back to more being myself. But I was never, yeah, I never, I don't think I ever had resistance to the um, idea of being a lesbian or the reality of being a lesbian at all. Did you communicate that to your parents? I did. Uh -huh. How soon after you came out to yourself did you do that? Not too long, maybe a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were not surprised in the slightest. Really? Huh. Yeah. Were they supportive? Just Very because? much, yeah. yeah. That's great. So prior to that experience, one of the reasons I asked this coming out stuff is um, this goes to Cal State Dominguez Hills, the big archives there. Uh -huh. UCLA, stuff like that. And I know that archivists at Cal State, personally, actually, and they introduce what we're doing to the students. So the coming out experience is vital to our survival. A lot of women, as you review these, have, were suicidal through one of the um, coming out steps, so to speak. Obviously, they got through it because I talked to them. But I uh, also knew a young woman who was suicidal and seriously so. And it was all coming out, but it was about her family relationships. It just wasn't about just being a lesbian. But she got through it, but it was difficult. Yeah. So I'm hoping that uh, through this what journey we're making that we can help someone. I don't want people, I want to know people. I don't want them to be dead. You know what I mean? I feel uh, just so fortunate in that my family's very, they're, you know, liberal Democrats for generations, and they're just 
kind and loving parents and they weren't perfect, but um, that, you know, <laughs> there was never any question that I, for me, I didn't have a fear that I was going to be ostracized or rejected or even really criticized. So that's great. Yeah, Good really. Right. And uh, I'm impressed with that. Yeah. Yeah, really. So uh, prior to that, did you have any inkling that you weren't exactly following the mode of your parents by being attracted to getting married? And, did you have? You know, I, I had boyfriends growing up. Okay. Uh, and so I think I more had the idea that I wasn't you know, doing exactly what they might have planned for me just because I was uh, just generally a little rebellious um, and insisting on doing my own path to to a certain extent, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, that's a positive. You've had a good coming out experience. Then. At five, when I was um, in school, my nun teacher Sister Clarice, actually, was her name? Oh, well, wow. <laughs> um, she taught us how to read. You know, I was in the first grade, and I was attracted to her because as she bent over into the reading chairs, I could see her cleavage, <laughs> and uh, I knew I became a really good reader. And uh, those little chairs, I was always in one. I could be there, and I knew that I wasn't supposed to talk about it. How I got that, I don't know, but I didn't talk. About then when I really came out, I threw away my birth control tools. I thought, okay, this is it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I was older than I was not five. So it's a process. Yeah. 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 And when I was younger, I think without even really knowing it, I think that I had this idea that um, like that everyone who had their friends sleep over kind of like wish they could snuggle up with them in the bed. Like I, did, I didn't think of it as making me different, but I also thought of it as like, uh, but I know I can't really do that. But I also had this kind of logic of like, why if there's, you know, if you have all these different options of, you know, boys, girls, whatever, like, why couldn't you just have them all? Just like you could have all the ice cream or whatever. But I just, at the same time, in, internally, I felt like that was all okay. And at the same time, I never talked to anybody about it until I came out as an adult. Yesterday, somebody mentioned those famous uh, sleepovers. Yeah. And all the massages that were, <laughs> that, you know, we, we adapt, you know, we're free. Of right. <laughs> Which is good. And that brought back a lot of memories, actually. And then when did you uh, decide to pursue law? Did you talk to your dad about it? Did you assume that? My, yeah, my dad always was, you know, enthused about the idea. I, I thought I studied literature in college and I thought I would uh, go on to grad school in literature, but I didn't do well on the GRE. Um, and I did do well on the LSAT, which I also took. Mm -hmm. And so I just, for whatever, a ridiculous reason let the standardized testing dictate my plans and uh, also I think at that time I was it was really when I was getting um, political and I was definitely aware that lawyers get to change things mm -hmm. uh, so I went to law school on a social justice agenda and that's been my career agenda as well and then you maintain that yeah Huh. Well, that's an interesting route, huh? Yeah. Nothing like testing. <laughs> it's funny now, knowing what I know about standardized testing, you know, it seems ridiculous, but uh, it was also, there were so many lawyers in my family and uh, it was so clearly a route that would suit me in some ways that it just seemed like the thing to do. Mm -hmm. Did you partner with any of those attorneys? I had a, a small law firm with a, my BFF from law school. We started a, a little law office right out of school, insane. <laughs> and uh, we had a lot of help from some lesbian lawyers who were mentors to us. Uh, and so I was with her for about four years and then she moved back East and I've been on my own solo practice ever since. It's a good idea. 
Let's be in the world solo. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know statistics, but as I listened and think of myself too, right? Mm -hmm. huh. So when you had your own practice, were you focused on social justice then when you started? Was that sort of your direction? Yeah, we started doing, I mean, we started doing a little bit of like whatever we could do to pay the bills. So we did some personal injury work. We did, um, I did a little bit of family law. Uh, we, and then we did, our first big case was a um, race discrimination and housing case mm -hmm. uh, that we litigated to a settlement. And then I started doing, so that was 1989, 90, 91. And so then I started doing a lot of work with people with AIDS um, and a lot of volunteering with the AIDS legal referral panel because um, this was obviously peak AIDS epidemic. And so I learned how to do um, insurance cases for people with HIV and uh, people with cancer who were being denied insurance benefits for either their health care or long-term uh, disability insurance benefits. And I did a lot of that kind of litigation. Well, where to find you? Did you I beg your pardon? How did people know where to find you? I don't know. I've never have had a problem getting clients. Right. It's word of mouth. It's word of mouth. I, I've always been really involved in the queer legal community. And so referrals just came that way. So what's been the greatest adventure of your legal career? Wow. Uh, so one was I had a lawsuit uh, on behalf of a gay man who was denied life insurance because his partner had HIV. He was HIV negative. So they denied him just on the basis of his association with the person with HIV. So I sued the insurance company and um, we ended up settling the case, but we also got a reported federal court decision, which means it was served as precedent for other cases that said that um, insurance is a public accommodation that is subject to anti-discrimination laws and um, that uh, I don't want to get technical about it, but basically gave him the right to go forward with his lawsuit um, that they were trying to shut down. And so that was a very proud moment for me in my career. Right. How long did it take the whole process from your awareness of the problem to? Oh my gosh, I think it was maybe two years, two and a half years. I remember visiting my father's office in Chicago and he was busy. And so I was sitting in the lobby, I was reading the docket. I said, Dad, it takes so long. <laughs> it does, it takes so long, yeah. 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 You think that'll ever change? No, I no, mean, yeah. lawsuits take forever. Mm -hmm. They just do. Uh, the other great adventure has been um, all of the work I've done for 30 years on LGBTQ family law. Mm -hmm. So, and the and the changes that I've seen and been part of creating uh, for queer parents, which I, I just could not have imagined 32 years ago what it would be like now to legal, you know, to legally protect your family as a queer parent. Um, it was so different then, and that's it's been amazing. Improved? You feel that it's improved now? Oh my gosh, yes. Good. Being a queer parent, right? Yeah, no, 100%. I mean, when I started, if there was a non-biological lesbian mom who had not done an adoption, her partner could just keep her from her kids. And there was nothing, people would come and, and there was a nothing we could do about it, nothing. Huh, and awesome. now that's just not possible anymore. So what changed that? What precedent changed that? Uh, there were a bunch of cases, like 2005 was a really big year for this. Uh, there were a number of cases that said, basically if two women, these cases were lesbian cases, if two women plan for a child together, uh, create the child together, right, through assisted reproduction, and parent the child together, they're both parents, regardless of whether they've taken any legal action. 
uh, to do an adoption, et cetera. They're both presumed to be parents. And That's then, right. yeah, I mean, it's huge. It's a huge point, right? It's huge. And, uh, and then there, so there were a number of cases kind of along those lines um, through that decade that established this presumption that if you're parenting a child, uh, you know, actively and with the consent of another parent and uh, based on your own intention to be a parent that you can have parental rights. Mm -hmm. And also the family, the California Family Code also became gender neutral. So the marital presumption now applies um, in a gender neutral manner. And that's a big change. Really big change, right? Yeah. And, and then of course, awesome. marriage, huge difference. I know, boy, we're all worried about marriage. <clears throat> yeah. Are you, married? Are you married? I am. Yeah, congratulations. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been with your uh, spouse? We have been together in November. It'll be uh, 18 years together and eight years married. Huh, great. Where did you um, meet her? Uh, I met her in her bookstore. She owned a bookstore. And uh, I met her there. My former partner actually introduced us. Mm -hmm. Really? <laughs> Were you already separate? At that yeah, time? we were already exes. Yeah. Never know. I know. <laughs> we have a lot of lesbian intrigue. Yeah. Oh, good. yeah. Good. What's her name? Her name's Luann Stouse. Oh, good. Well, we hope to interview her. Tell her. Oh, you would love to interview her. She's a super interesting and fun person. No, have her call me. That'd be great. But um, back to you. So what about your greatest adventure now in your life in general? Oh my gosh, <laughs> so hard. I mean, it's hard right now. Like, uh, you're a change agent. Do you feel like that? Yes, I do. Okay. Good. I can yeah. 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 So I feel like, uh, from a work perspective, the, you know, trying to always make the law better and more accommodating and more protective for queer families is ongoing. Um, I think right now there's a lot of risk out there. You know, we don't know what's going to happen with the Dobbs decision, the you know, the one that's going to overturn Roe v. Wade and how that's going to impact us. So feeling, I guess, I don't know if I would say it's an adventure. I feel very protective toward all the families that I've right. helped to, you know, create and solidify over the years and wanting to make sure that they're okay. Um, so that's going to be whatever it is when that opinion comes down. I'd say that's probably my next adventure work-wise. I'm actually um, sorry that one of the justices carries my name, Eric. Yeah. I mean, I can't believe it. I can't believe that she's made the statement. Well, this will give a lot of lesbians the opportunity to adopt. I mean, I could, you know, like, we have nothing better to do. We're going to go to some parking lot and pick out a baby. Yeah. I mean, it's just uh, stunning. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. So you know my position on that. That's good. So what's your favorite fairy tale? My favorite fairy tale? I, well, I like, I like a lot of Buddhist stories. Do you? Okay. So I don't know if I would call, call, are they fairy tales? I mean, the Buddha was a real person, oh, but. A Disney movie, just something sort of fantasy wise. Um, okay, well, so my favorite Buddhist, uh, I'll say it's a fantasy story, I guess, is uh, um, the Buddha told his monks to go in the forest and set up their meditation uh, huts for the rainy season. And they did, but they picked a spot that's very beautiful, very perfect. But there were all these devas there, which are these little um, uh, forest dwelling fairies, basically. And the devas were not happy that the uh, monks had moved in so they started making all these sounds and smells that were really unpleasant and the monks went back to the buddha and were like oh no what's we can't be out there because the devas uh. and the buddha said when you go back just i want you to go back and i want you to meditate on what something that's called metta which is just a, a wish that all beings should be well and happy and safe and free so he said, go back and meditate and just spend all your time meditating. May all beings be happy. May all beings be free. May all beings be safe. And they did. And they just sat there and meditated in that way for, you know, 
24 seven and the devas all were like, oh, that's so nice. And they stopped <laughs> making the bad smells and the bad sounds and all was peaceful in the forest. And so that's my favorite story. That's my story. When did you first become acquainted with that story? Oh my gosh, years, yeah. many years ago, when probably 20 story? years ago. If only we would do that. Right. <laughs> that's the idea. Yes. Yeah. That's the idea that if we all would go around wishing each other well all the time, things would be very different. That's our mission. I think a lot of women I share that idea have a mission like that. We don't, we're, it's a journey. Yeah. But, oh, how interesting. Will you write your story? I don't know. I doubt <laughs> it. I, I'm not much for that kind of thing. And I am um, also, my memory is bad for detail. <laughs> is it? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, it has its good points and bad points, you know. But you know, um, I'm, I encourage you to write. I don't write, um, I write slum, but not a book. So many women have written books, I'm impressed yeah. with them. And, uh, but your memory comes back, just like that memory of that nun and the reading chairs. And, you know, I don't think of that on a daily basis, but just in interacting, it came to me. So you might find that happens. And you don't, probably don't have time. Uh, right now, I don't, but I hope to not be working full time for yeah. indefinitely. Yeah. How much longer do you think you'll work? I'll probably, I just turned 60 a week ago. Um, so I'll probably work full time, like five to seven more years, and then probably part time for a while. Mm -hmm. I think that for us, we've been very active, and but finding the transition of what you're going to do is an important element. Don't just think, oh, I gotta travel. It's <laughs> yeah. People do th think that. Oh, where are you gonna travel to? I don't know. Yeah, I'm a little <laughs> bit addicted to uh, volunteering, so I don't know what I'll end up doing, but something. What kind of volunteering? Boards, and uh, you know, I volunteer in court to help people who are unrepresented, and just different whatever kind of comes along. <laughs> but mostly, I've done board work. So, That's great. So in closing, do you have any more questions? Any things you'd like to tell? This is remember, this is your story. Other thing I would say is that I one of the great joys that I've had in being a lawyer is the um, is my colleagues and that the the queer legal community is so creative and so supportive and just so powerful, the things that we've been able to accomplish. And that just has been everything to me. I could not have, like, I'm a solo practitioner, but I don't ever feel like I'm doing my work all alone. That's great. So if you knew um, that you were going to not be in this earth soon, you had, what would you like to be remembered for? Uh, I would say for my work with queer families, for advancing the law and protecting a lot of families just with my work, yeah. And also for being, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who cared about other people. Uh -huh. Well, as a queer family and as just a lesbian, I appreciate your work. Thank you. It really is, has great meaning and uh, it's a gift. Thank you. So thank you so much. Emily. Oh, it was a pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Stay in touch if any. If we can ever help you, let us know. Oh, thank you. You're so kind. <laughs>